Hey guys, welcome back to the Dr. Cliff Show. I'm Dr. Cliff Olson, founder of Applied Hearing Solutions in Phoenix, Arizona. And I am here today with my two co-hosts. We have Dr. Rachel Cook and Dr. Kelsey Beck. Welcome into the studio again. I know you guys do this stuff all the time, but how was clinic today? Oh, pretty good. It was a long day. Happy that it's Friday. Um, but a really good day. Clinic's actually been moving really, really well. We're getting back in the swing of the things mm -hmm. and uh, the snowbirds are back and everything. So <laughs> it has been busy around the clinic. Yeah, we uh, had a lot of walk-ins I think this week as we well. We did. Just some you know, random repairs and uh, I feel like I was kind of juggling multiple things all at the same time um, pretty much all week. So kind of like Dr. Cook said, really happy that we're Friday, getting to relax, getting to kind of chat and hang out, which is always really fun. Yeah. Right on, right on. Uh, if you're anything like me, I actually like being busy because the day just ends up flying by. I feel like I'm in clinic for 10 minutes a day when I'm in the clinic. I know, you always do. Because it's just yeah. like so fast, like yeah. so fast paced. It does go so fast. I think too though, like it depends on like the pacing of the day. So like sometimes like you'll have like just a weird like 15 minutes, but then you'll have like like it like sometimes that spacing gets weird where like you can't seem to get into a groove i feel like i had that this week where i was like yes it was really busy and there was a lot of people coming in and out but i just was like shifting so much this week so uh yeah yeah restart well, next week yeah, yeah exactly that's, there right, we go that's exactly Started right again. yeah so so today we're actually talking about Costco hearing centers. This is always mm -hmm. a relatively controversial topic anytime mm -hmm. that we talk about it <laughs> because we are not Costco uh, hearing care providers, mm -hmm. right? Right. Um, nor are we uh, individuals who have been personally treated at Costco. Right. But I really wanted to just provide some insight as to, you know, kind of what their process is you know, uh, the hearing aids that they offer, some uh, definite, like what their business model is, some of the pros that they have going for them, and then maybe some of the negatives here as well. Mm -hmm. So have a good well-rounded episode here today. Um, I'll start off by talking about the process that they follow. Right. So I actually sent in my assistant, Bree, who's now in grad school mm -hmm. to become an audiologist. Uh, she has a mild to moderate hearing loss. She, as you guys know, is a test subject for all of the <laughs> over-the-counter <laughs> hearing aids that I evaluate yeah. inside of the clinic. Yes. but. We had an opportunity when the, the KS10s came out at, at Costco to have her go in, have a hearing evaluation. The whole purpose is to, for her to kind of evaluate what was their actual process when she goes in. Mm -hmm. Now, not to say that all Costco's run exactly the same way, but you could make a reasonable assumption that they have a certain system that they prefer their providers to go through. Right. Um, and so, uh, essentially, she scheduled an hour visit, took a couple months for her to get in initially, but she had that appointment, went in, got a hearing test right off the bat, spent really a few minutes. I mean, you only have so much time in an hour to, to accomplish what you need to on a hearing mm -hmm. evaluation, but went in, chat with the provider for a few minutes about you know her hearing difficulties, went right into the hearing test. After the hearing test, they reviewed the hearing test with her and said, okay, yes, you do have a hearing loss. Yes, you could get benefit with hearing aids. And then the provider uh, proceeded to kind of like say, okay, so here's the devices that we work with. Mm -hmm. uh, we work with several different brands. Is there a particular hearing aid that you were thinking of? And Brie knew that we also wanted to review the KS10 10.0Ts right. uh, yeah. inside of our clinic and of course for the YouTube channel. And so she naturally went into, I'll take this one. Mm -hmm. And in hindsight, I wish I would have instructed her to be like, no, like you take the recommendation of them. If they yeah, ask right. you to choose, you wait and you let them say, hey, here's the device and here's why. Mm -hmm. um, that didn't happen. So um, I'm not really sure if every single scenario like that, if, if a patient uh, set, comes in with their mindset on the device that they want, if they always accommodate for that, um, or if, they, if the patient has no clue what they want, mm -hmm. if the provider you know, says, well, I would actually go with this then. Yeah. Um, we know that the KS10s by far outsurpassed any sales of any of the other devices Handsome. in Costco. But they ended up fitting her, uh, having her walk around, you know, the, the warehouse like mm -hmm. you typically do at Costco or like people typically do at Costco. And then they scheduled her for a fitting appointment. Uh, she came in for the fitting appointment. They did really her measurement on her and then uh, didn't really counsel her a whole lot about the devices and insertion and removal and charging and all of that. Um, a lot of that stuff, I think, maybe inherently because Brie just knows about hearing aids that it was a very mm -hmm. quick part of the, the fitting appointment. And then they did have her come back for a couple of additional follow-ups okay. um, for her to get some fine tuning and stuff like that. Um, ultimately, 
she did end up keeping the devices. We still have <laughs> the devices. Oh my gosh. Um, so she didn't end up returning them. I think as far as the provider knows at this point, unless they watch the review video um, <laughs> that you guys can find on the channel, of course, um, I think the provider is like, okay, well, she ended up being satisfied enough with the treatment that she decided to keep the hearing aids. Right. Um, but I think that this is, that's probably a fairly common um, approach that is taken in a lot of Costco's. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but with that said, I mean, is that the way that is ideal to go through a treatment process? Mm -hmm. I think that mm -hmm. as far as being ideal, I mean, I will note I am biased. I'm a perfectionist. I want to do everything exactly the right way. You know, I really want to like spend a lot of time and really get into nitty gritty and really, you know, make sure that I'm sending someone out into the world at least for you know like the first week right knowing exactly what they need to know for the first week then you can kind of layer in some more education over time um, Costco of course is not set up that way which is okay um, but I think that it does really give a lot of accessibility to a lot of people who would not necessarily have another option or um, could afford you know going to a private practice or something like that as well so I think that you know is it necessarily my ideal no, but I think that within that time, you can still probably get a lot of people fit pretty well, you know, as long as you are doing really your measurement correctly and all of that. Yeah, I, th I think that especially in Bree's case, um, there was definitely the advantage of the fact that they probably did look at her and go, she can figure out how to put these in her ears. Right. She can figure out how to hook them up to her phone. She yeah. can figure out, you know, yeah. it was kind of like a... Yeah, she'll read the instruction manual and she'll I mean, be she, fine. at the time in her early 20s, right? Yeah, you would like, assume technologically. You can use Bluetooth, yeah. yeah. There's not a huge discussion on what's the difference between Bluetooth and, and Wi Fi, Wi -Fi. <laughs> <laughs> and all of those things. So, so I think in Bree's case, now is that the case for everybody? And is that the case for a large majority of hearing aid users that, that might be a bit older? Um, they might not be as technologically savvy, so it may not be ideal for them. Um, that's a lot of where the counseling comes in on here's how you do these things and here's how you do them appropriately, so. I think one of the things that Brie had mentioned, cause she obviously was reporting back to me so I could create this video about the process that Costco follows, yeah, at least secret, in- Secret shopping. Right, a secret shopping <laughs> in a way, at least in her uh, perspective, yeah, right? right? For her individual uh, provider that she went to see, cause we all know that your ability to get a good treatment outcome is heavily dependent on the provider, provider. that you see. I would right? argue probably mostly dependent uh, on the provider Mostly dependent, you yeah. See. Um, and so like, and I think of it this way, like you have an excellent provider that works at a Costco hearing center. You'd be silly not to go to that particular 100%. Costco and work with that individual, right? Um, I think the things that she was running into is that she felt like when she came back with concerns, because she ultimately did not do very well mm -hmm. with the KS10s, um, she actually wears a completely different brand that we had fit her with in our yeah. clinic and does much better with them mm -hmm. than what she did with the KS10s. and. The, the problem was is that when she went in with these complaints, the provider was like, didn't really know and didn't really explain what that was and, and here's the, the reason I'm making this particular adjustment. None mm -hmm. of that was actually explained. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Brie understood what she was doing. Yeah, like right. she could tell because she had hung out in our clinic long enough to know like, okay, I know the approach that you're actually doing here, but it wasn't articulated very well in a way that mm -hmm. it would give someone the confidence that a proper adjustment was actually being made. Right. Yeah, and, and I found myself in that position when I was working at an ENT practice. And I think it all really boils down to time that's available. And so in that type of position, I had 30 minutes or 15 minutes or 10 minutes to try to get the biggest bang for your buck out of that appointment. And oftentimes that did require me completing verification measures or different um, you know, validation outcome measures or things like that. And a lot of the counseling really falls to the wayside because counseling takes time. Mm -hmm. It's a discussion, it's a conversation. There is back and forth that's there. It's not something that you can just sum up very quickly or send someone out the door with a piece of paper. It's gonna be different for every single person mm -hmm. depending on how comfortable they are with the subject and things like that. So um, I, I found myself in that position and I can nearly guarantee that that is where the individuals who work at Costco find themselves in as well. It's maybe not that they don't know what they're talking about necessarily, they just don't have the time to key you in on mm -hmm. what it is that, why they're doing the things that they're doing and in full detail. Well, you know, when you think about it, one of the, uh, uh, let's talk about the benefits. I know we're gonna talk about technology. We'll, we'll definitely get to that because I know people are interested in the tech side of things, but let's talk about like what 
really is the intent of a Costco hearing center. It, like, if you had to say, like, number one right off the bat, like, what's the purpose? Sell a hearing aid. Cheap hearing aid. Well, it, it, it sell a hearing aid and have that hearing aid... Be cheap. Be cheap, yeah. right? Um, and, and I don't know, like, is cheap the right word? Uh, is it low cost? Low cost, right? Low cost. Um, low maybe cost. cheap. Cheap has a negative connotation yeah. with it because um, it's often associated with a lower cost item, but lower cost doesn't necessarily always mean that it's a bad product either. Right, so and, and you could make the cost. argument that, that the devices that they sell there that we'll talk about here in a minute are are good devices mm -hmm. right at a minimum they're good yeah right, right? Um, so so low cost is definitely a thing I think convenience would be another mm -hmm, benefit yep. of going to Costco yeah I mean you can really just you know oh hey there's a hearing center here I'm here for I don't know I really like their keto uh, Reese's peanut butter cups so yeah. grab me with some peanut butter cups and then also maybe get a hearing test as well you I know? was actually interested to say when you said that Brie had to wait a few months yeah yeah to get in I yeah. was like wait a second I thought you could just like walk up and well, be like I want hearing I think aids. it depends on the market obviously here in the Phoenix area in the winter time Busy. like you're gonna yeah. wait Crazy, you're gonna wait yeah. um, you you come here in the summertime you're gonna walk in and be like this is a ghost town <laughs> I think you know yeah and do your first follow-up in the afternoon right? yeah yeah um, but and then you go to like I don't know does does North Dakota even have a Costco but I don't know actually there's question. there are a lot of I, I see on like hearing aid forums where people say oh you know I want to go to Costco and I want to get set up there closest Costco to me is two and a half hours away and I'm like what yeah. I forget that there are much more rural areas totally. where Costco's not an option for them are, either. But, but people will travel a really long oh, yeah. distance to get oh, to yeah. the Costco. And yeah. I would say that's actually probably a benefit is that if you go to Costco to get your hearing aids and you want those hearing aids serviced, you really have to go to a Costco if they need to go in for repair mm -hmm. to the manufacturer. So if you happen to be in a different city or state or you move, you could technically take your hearing aids into another Costco location and get help there. Yeah, that's that is point. another really big benefit in that your hearing aid clinic exists all over the country in in many different areas yeah yeah so I think uh, there's there's definitely clearly benefits to it I would I would make the argument that doing real ear measurements mm -hmm. is definitely a benefit they mm -hmm. did real ear mm -hmm. measurement on Brie um, it didn't result in an ideal outcome for her but I think mm -hmm. that was more the technology that they elected to let her select for herself yeah, rather right. than making a direct recommendation right. without necessarily asking which one she'd prefer mm -hmm. to use. Yeah. I do wonder as well, you know, if someone is not having good success and, you know, let's say they did like breathing you know, and they had really a measurement done and all of that, is that provider then also afforded that time to say, you know, maybe that we should try a different hearing aid? Or is it, well, this is just kind of how hearing aids work. It's not going to be perfect. Like, I, I do wonder what that approach would be. And again, probably really depends on the actual provider that you see. Um, I don't know necessarily what their policy is on that. I mean, I know that you can return the hearing aids for, what, six months yeah. after you purchase them. Yeah. So, I mean, Which there's a crazy. big return That's crazy. Window. Yeah. So, that there's another true. pro right there. If, mm -hmm. you're, if you're really the type that wants that long yeah. return window, mm -hmm. that's that's going to be the longest return window you're going to have for hearing aids. Now, this sure. is totally anecdotal. We obviously spend time on consumer forums on Facebook yes. and, and mm -hmm. other forums. Um, there was a report from a patient that said that they wanted to test out multiple different devices at Costco, and the provider said management doesn't like when we have a lot of returns. Mm. So. Um, it does play into their numbers then. It, it, and so here's the thing, like uh, I do think there's some potential positive of there not being a uh, like commission structure there other than mm -hmm. the providers earning a salary from Costco. That technically is commission in a mm -hmm. way, like you're paid to go there and move hearing aids. But they do have requirements, like you can't just go there and not dispense hearing aids as a provider. Like mm -hmm. there are requirements that you yeah. have to sell hearing aids when you work at a Costco location. Mm -hmm. I don't personally think there's anything wrong with that. Like, no. Like to it, offer it a service, sense. you have to actually sell something and make money. So right, like right. you will never catch me saying it's a bad thing for a company like Costco to have quotas on selling hearing aids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, and again, as long as that quota is reasonable and it doesn't result in someone you know, prescribing something that's inappropriate for somebody because they have to hit their quota for hearing aids when maybe they should be in a cross system or maybe they should actually be a cochlear implant candidate because I have seen that as well where it's like, well, you know, I could make that recommendation, but I do need to sell my hearing aids for the month. So again, that's more probably provider to provider again. I don't Definitely. know what that pressure structure looks like because again, I've never worked there, but if there is that kind of pressure, I do wonder about that as well.
Mm. I think if there is pressure, it's probably very low. I, I, would hope I, I so. can't imagine that a company that big has a ton of pressure to sell no. massive quantities I'm of sure. hearing aids. I well, think they get plenty anyway. of sales anyway. Yeah. Right? You sell at that price point. What happens when you sell at a lower price point? Ooh, everybody you, wants it. Everybody wants like the lower the cost, the supply and demand, or no, it's um, you know, low cost, high demand, right? Yeah. Like uh, what is that called? That's it's not supply demand, is it? Because that's supply, a supply, supply thing. Supply and demand. No, because that's oh. like supply and then demand. Like when you have less supply of something, I don't know, but demand. it happens to me all the time. Because when I see something on clearance that I don't even need, I'm like, "But it's on clearance. Yeah. You, I, I made it. money uh, off exactly, of it." Exactly. Right? I'm like, if I don't buy it these hearing aids at Costco, it, it would, would be financially irresponsible of me to not take this deal right or now. Or like when you have to like spend extra ten dollars to get free shipping. Well, it's like you made money on it, right? That's like, exactly oh, right. We were talking about girl math the other day. Uh, yeah. This is a girl math situation. Yeah. Can you Wait, explain what girl math is? Oh <laughs> yeah, let me just unfold this. Okay. Girl math, oh, I can't. I, I don't know I how can. to sum, sum it up. I absolutely can. So girl math is this process by which women go through when they are looking to justify and a large And it's not just purchase. women because oh, men I do, do it too. this. Cliff admitted several yeah, times. I know that you He's do like, too. He's like, I girl math hard. <laughs> right, for sure. But this, but it's been branded as girl math, so we'll leave that in that sure. context, right? But it's not necessarily women who do it. But it's essentially the process by which you go and justify a large purchase and you see just how you know many times you'll use it. So for example, I once bought a very expensive purse. I'm a little bit ashamed to admit how much I spent on said purse, but the reason, the rationale that I used it, I use it every single day, every single year for the last four years. You divide all of that up, and it's like I spent like three dollars a day for the last four oh years my gosh. on my bag okay. or something oh my like gosh. that. That's still pretty steep <laughs> to me. Steep. I'm still, yeah. You're gonna but have to hey, keep using it for but the next I'm decade. But that's right. It, right? Here because in another twenty years, it'll be like you're down to like uh, fifty cents a, well, and here's a day. A, and here's the thing too: is that as long as I continue to use it, I continue then to you know utilize that. But then eventually, I'll actually make money on it because I'm still using it past that original commitment that I made oh. to spend. And you're not buying any more purses. Correct. I just have that one purse. And because it's such a high quality, it has lasted and has held, uh, withstood the test of time. So no. other girl math opportunity or, or situations are going to be um, cash. Cash doesn't count. No, doesn't cash count. is a gift it's card. It's already not in your account. I don't even want to get into that one. Um, if something's on clearance and you don't necessarily need it, but it's on such good clearance, it is a disservice to yourself to not get it. At this mm -hmm. point, I should have several sets of KS 10.0 teeth. <laughs> I, they're, they're gonna, I'm going to go in there and they're going to be like, ma'am, you have normal hearing. Like, what are you doing here? It's a bargain. What do you want me to do? Well, I hate to burst your bubble, but the 10.0T doesn't <laughs> exist, exist anymore. anymore. Okay, like, I know. Uh, so when you start looking at Costco and the hearing aids they provide, so they've got the Jabra brand, they've got the Philips brand, they have the Rexton brand, which is probably the most familiar one inside of Costco mm -hmm, at this mm -hmm. point. Um, but what happened to the, the Kirkland Signature? First off, what are the Kirkland Signature hearing aids? The Kirkland Signature hearing aids are in uh, a white label version of a Sonova hearing aid. So they're a Sonova product. They're not dissimilar at all to the uh, Paradise, the Phonak Paradise hearing aids that we have fit in our clinic as well. Um, but they were having, uh, or their report rather, said that they were having a lot of issues with the charging of the units and things like that. So there were uh, some reliability issues, and so that caused them to then discontinue to sell the KS10Ts. And that was yes. some pretty big news about a year ago now yeah. mm -hmm. that they're like, you know, what? we've had so many charging issues with these hearing aids. Uh, so you were talking about cheap earlier. It's uh -huh. like, well, maybe they were cheap. I maybe mean, they th were. when you have to manufacture them at that quantity for that low of mm -hmm. a price maybe they're sacrificing something mm -hmm. on the build quality? Yeah. Well, and I am re I am working with a pair of KS10s right now. We're in a fitting sequence and kind of overhauling the programming for a lot of reasons, which we can get into later. But even just like working with the KS10s, I, like the, the casing itself doesn't feel like it's as high quality. The button feels very flimsy and fragile. So the materials are definitely of a different quality than the you know name brand phone act devices are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they look similar, but they are different. When you mm -hmm. compare uh, what a, a KS 10.0T to a Phonak Adeo Paradise mm -hmm. uh, RT, when you look at them, they are physically look different. Yeah, right? they do. Um, so there is some differences that they made there. Are there differences that they made with the charger, with the batteries that they use, the way that they build out the units? Mm -hmm. We don't know. We'll probably never get an answer on that unless someone who you know does manufacturing of, or yeah. did manufacturing of those comments on this particular mm -hmm. channel. But. but here's my thing. When something like that comes out with any other type of brand or product, generally what happens is, oh no, we've got these major issues. 
we're gonna do either some sort of recall or like what Costco is doing right now, which is we won't fit you with that product, we'll fit you with a different product. But I've been waiting for them to replace and put out a new product, a new Kirkland Signature product to take the place of that. And that didn't happen. And in fact, it went a step further and Phonak also took their products and pulled out of Costco and said, Sayonara. Yeah, no more Phonak. So, After like 10 years mm -hmm, of Phonak yeah. being in Costco. I have a hard time believing that it was solely just the reliability of the charge on those devices. Just given the fact that you would think that they'd come and they'd go, okay, six months down the line, all right, new product, it's back, it's better, and we're right, good. Right, yeah. and, and moving on. That has not happened. You know what, historically, it ha it wasn't always Sonova that was making those products. Mm -hmm. They did the KS9s and the KS10s. Prior to that, it was uh, Savantos, which owns Signia yeah. and mm -hmm. Rexton. Uh, prior to that, I think it was maybe even Resound, Resound or GN that was yeah. making it. And, and you can go back, obviously, all the way to the KS1s. Mm -hmm. um, so multiple different brands, what they do is that they, they basically bid for the contract of manufacturing these particular products. They don't want to devalue their name brand, mm -hmm. and so they, they make it under the brand of Kirkland Signature so they can lower the price. Obviously, people have gotten wise to that, so I, I, this might be a reason why we haven't seen the Kirkland Signature brand come back is because they saw or they see the pricing go down and down and down. And while that might be great for consumers who need affordable hearing aids, that's really bad for the brand mm -hmm. that is actually manufacturing. And I would make the argument, you guys know what I'm going to say here, I would make the argument that I'm not an MBA, right? but I think the dumbest decision that a hearing aid manufacturer could ever do is agree to make the white yeah. label product mm -hmm. for the Kirkland Signature. Mm -hmm. yeah, because consumers are so smart nowadays. I was gonna say, what, what does everybody say? Oh, it's the same as the Paradise. Mm -hmm. It's the same as the product that you distribute privately to other hearing aid clinics. Um, they keep making this comparison, same, same, same. Well, as a consumer, I'd be like, well, then why am I going to go get a Phonak Paradise when I could go get some right. KS10s? Right, like, and, and Phonak makes significantly less profit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the margins cannot be great because they're selling, what, a set of those, well, they were anyway, for what, like $1,300 for yeah. the pair? Oh my gosh. I mean, you can't even, to, like, our, can't like, at order cost, one. you can't yeah, order one cost, of yeah, those exactly. at cost for the same, I mean, that just it's just not possible. So they really are honestly competing against, against themselves. themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Which through through. makes absolutely no sense. Now again, like, is it ethical to just, you know, overcharge and all of that for, you know, all of these name brand prescriptive hearing aids? I mean, we can go on a whole other tangent about, you know, how expensive hearing aid technology has gotten and all of those things. And having an accessible line that is prescriptive level, honestly, for everybody else would be phenomenal. Right for consumers, I mean, yeah. to be able to have that kind of accessibility is great, and it's really stupid on the manufacturer's part. So I can totally see why they wouldn't even want to do that. Why none? Of, if there are you know open bids for this new Kirkland Signature, I can kind of understand why maybe that maybe there aren't any other manufacturers who are jumping at the bit or yeah. jumping at the bit to you know. Well, if they get were, I there. can tell you that unless there's some weird contractual obligation mm -hmm. with Sonova that they can't release a new KS10 for a certain period mm -hmm. of time. I have no idea, right? But uh, that would be the only other reason. It's like, because mm -hmm. you, you sell a ton of units when you're the KS mm -hmm. uh, brand, a the ton most. of them. The most out of everyone else combined yeah. right. in a Costco. And uh, you would sell a ton of units, but if you don't actually make money, enough money to justify making all of those units for Costco, why would you do it? Yeah. Well, and then to justify it a little bit further, it's like, well, if I just stop giving them the other option, that's the only option that's left as well. So it's not even, you know what I mean? Now you can still get some decent priced hearing aids at Costco from one of those 100%. other brands that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. I want to say they're around 2400 so mm -hmm. a little over a thousand more than what you would have been able to purchase the KS line for. And to some people that, that makes a difference. Now Costco did do a solid for some of the, or for their members is that they took some of those other brands like the Philips brand and I think maybe the Jobber brand and they actually lowered the cost on those. I don't know if they got them all the way down to the KS price. Um, but it's uh, it's definitely more, they made those more affordable because mm -hmm. they're like, eh, people got used to yeah, buying yeah. hearing aids. And now, funny thing happens when you price anchor someone at a low price point, all of a mm -hmm. sudden when you're a Costco hearing aid user and you just bought your hearing aids at 1400 bucks or 1300 bucks a pair, and now they're asking 24, 2500 bucks a pair, mm -hmm. what are you thinking? 
you start mm-hmm. looking looking around. You're like, what the heck? I'm getting yeah. getting ripped off. Like now I'm getting ripped yeah. off. Yeah, exactly. So so they, they probably that was probably a good business decision on Costco's part to lower the price mm-hmm. of some of those other products, regardless of whether they're they're actually as good or better than what the KS tens were. Yeah. Well, and here's the thing too. I mean, we talk about this all the time with you know the you know the brand name devices as well. Is that the product itself can be a great product if you don't set it up the right way terrible product if you are in the wrong manufacturer for you because the way that your brain processes the world does not match with how that hearing aid processes sound well then you're also going to do poorly as well and so you mean again you could have a great tool and still not be very successful right let's talk about that a little bit more because we talked about some of the pros like you know low cost they do really measurement they Mm -hmm. will do a hearing test on you um and uh, but but what are some of the things that like even if you do real or measurement, why are we getting so many patients that we see are not doing well with their hearing treatment? And there's a, a ton of factors that go into that. Um, circling back to the idea of time again, um, there's a lot of front end discovery that goes into determining what make and model or style of a hearing aid is going to be the best hearing aid for someone's wants and needs. And unfortunately, uh, I think anyone can look at an audiogram and pick a hearing aid that they think is going to be best for that type of hearing loss. But there are so many other factors Mm -hmm. that go into that when it comes down to lifestyles, values, goals, different listening communications or um, challenging listening environments for them. So if we don't take the time to discover that and unfold all of that in the very, very beginning, then you may end up with a great product. It's just not a great product for you. Mm -hmm. Um, And I feel like a lot of people do end up in that type of a situation where they may come to us or just be dissatisfied with their devices going like, well, I thought I got the top of the line. Well, you did get a good product, but it's not optimized for you and it's not the correct product for what you're looking to achieve Mm -hmm. out of your hearing treatment. Yeah, I think another thing that you bring up as well um, about the hearing test itself and you know the audiogram, the audiogram tells a piece of the story, Mm -hmm. right? But it doesn't tell the whole story, especially when we start talking about the number one complaint of people with hearing loss, which is background noise. Yep. I have not seen now, this could be wrong, and so if you are work at Costco and you do this testing, please c- leave a comment, let us know. But I have not seen a single Costco hearing test that has a speech and background noise test. I haven't seen Not a either. one. Um, which, for me, is a really big deal because even just today, I had what looked like an, it was going to be a very straightforward audiogram. You know, I would have fit it with a very particular device. But then we got to that speech and background noise test and it was a really not a great score and suddenly my entire recommendation changed because I he was not going to be able to be successful with that sort of noise background noise processing that I was originally thinking and I had to pivot. And so if you don't have that information, you go out and then you come back in even if you've had real ear measurement done, even if they're set up, you know, exactly to your prescription because you were lucky enough to have a Costco provider who did all of those things, you're still not maybe in that best place for yourself because you don't have this other piece of information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think speech and noise testing obviously is super critical. It's definitely a best practice uh, procedure that needs to be done on everybody um, at some point and ideally at the initial testing because you shouldn't be making technology recommendations without having an understanding of Mm -hmm. what their speech and noise score is that gives you a signal to noise ratio loss score. Um, And I talk about this all the time on my channel. I talk about it in forums when people are like, which hearing aids are best for me? I'm like, well, I don't know. What's, what are all these other variables that outside mm-hmm. of just the X's and O's that you see And it always makes people mad. Every time. All, every time, it always makes people mad. Enraged. Because they're like, can you, just, can you just tell me what's a good one? And it's like, well, what's a good one for you? For, mm-hmm. you, for yourself, for you. Well, just say the, the best one. Well, I don't know if it's the best one for you. I mean, there's so, like, I know that it has to be frustrating on the consumer side because so much emphasis is placed on product product, product, product. What brand are you in? What style are you in? But at the end of the day, okay, great products. We've got manufacturers. We've got so many products. It's Mm -hmm. like ridiculous these days. You're going to end up in a great product. Mm -hmm. You can end up in a great product, but is it the right one for you? (laughs) So it's like, sometimes it's that difficult. And you and I were talking, talking kind of about this the other day as well. And you brought up a great analogy too, which is, you know, if you have some kind of an infection, right? and you're allergic to all kinds of medications and things like that, and your doctor is not going to lay out 
all of the different uh, antibiotics that you could take and say, well, which one do you want to take? Yeah. It's like, no, given all of these variables about, variables about you, this is going to be the one that's actually going to treat this particular type of infection, even though there are thousands, I don't know if thousands, but probably thousands of antibiotics out <laughs> there, none of which yeah. I can pronounce the name of. Well, and I think that that also really reinforces the idea that a great, not even a good, not even an okay provider, a great provider is the difference in your hearing aid performance. Mm -hmm. Because like you just said, if I have 10 different antibiotics in front of me and a provider looks at me and goes, which one do you want? Um, that's not my decision. Uh, you're, I came to you because you are the professional, mm -hmm. you are the expert in this field. Mm -hmm. I would love for you to make this decision for me based on what I'm telling you. Yeah. And if they uh, ask me that, I'm starting to freak out inside because I'm like, oh I'm like, gosh, you don't know. Exactly. Like, do they not know? So yeah, I Based think I think it's important to give patients choices, of course, choices that fall within the guidelines that have been set by their audiological results and by their, their wants, their needs, their values. There are still choices within that, but it is uh, on the part of the provider to guide patients towards what would mm -hmm. be the best option for them. Mm -hmm. And so it sounds like in, in Bree's situation, you know, several things were laid in front of her, kind of like, which one do you like? Which one do you want? Um, it's not really about what you like mm -hmm. on those. It's what you need, but right. you, need the, you need the guidance of a provider yeah. to push you into that decision. And I feel like that, you know, audiology is one of few, if not the only, like healthcare, you know, thing, healthcare service where that really exists. Because, yeah. you know, like you have your options for eyeglasses, right? Like you can pick the style of the eyeglass that you like, right? You know, I want a fun color. This person wants, you know, the tortoise shell. But your prescription is the same. And, and you know, and, and I always hate comparing things to eyeglasses, but, you know, realistically, this thing, the lenses still need to be set up the right way for you, right? They still need to be with the right lenses. Mm -hmm. For example, most you know adults have like the progressive lenses, right? I actually can't wear those. I have to wear like the child's glasses that are set up completely differently because of the way my brain actually processes it, right? So like if you don't have that guidance, then you really are just, you know, guessing in the dark instead of having, you know, the professional tell you, okay, based on all these things, this is what's actually good for you. And I don't see that anywhere else in healthcare. And I don't think it's wrong to ask a patient, like, have you done research on particular, you know, oh, products? 100%. Like obviously the channel that we have, like we're educating on these different products with their capabilities are I do like someone to come in with some level of oh, education yeah. Yeah. on that and but the, the difference is is that if I see certain variables in testing that I'm like you really should not go with that device yeah. I need to be able to be like listen I know you want this one here's what you give up if you go with it versus mm -hmm. going with this one that will allow me to treat your hearing loss much better right, right. And, and nine times out of ten they'll go with the recommendation once they know why exactly. but again, all of that has to do with, like with what you said was time, time. Yeah. right because I would need time to explain no, I hear you what you want. I know that I'm really glad you did, but like you don't have the time to do that necessarily in the Costco format. You just and don't. I, I feel bad for Costco providers because I think, I, in fact, I don't think, I know that there's a lot of great providers inside of Costco. I've had yeah. conversations with them um, and their ways of thinking about things are very similar to the ways that I think about them. That's the variable though, is the time, time. that they're mm -hmm. allowed to spend with patients or that, you know, if you're a super popular Costco location like we have here in Phoenix during the winter time, mm -hmm. like, sorry, you don't have a choice. You have to see a ton of people and that cuts down the amount of time that you can actually spend. Mm -hmm. And I think that maybe this is part of the reason why we get patients into our clinic who've come from Costco, they're not really happy with the way, way that they're doing it. And, and like you guys said already, it's not necessarily the technology that's the problem. It's how they were set up. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I talk a lot about realer measurement on the channel. Mm -hmm. uh, we all talk about realer measurement all the time. And it, the question becomes is, well, how can you do realer measurement? It's mandated by Costco. It is a key performance indicator, a KPI at Costco to do realer measurement. Um, and realer measurement is being done from what I have seen in most cases, but if it's being done, why are these patients not having a high level of success? Because yeah. it's only one element of this entire major picture. I mean, real or measurement is fantastic. Mm -hmm. It is fantastic. It is not, it, it is a, essentially a guideline and it will allow you to get the devices programmed as closely to the prescription as possible. 
but the way that you process sound, you process sound, I process sound, again, the environments, the places that you are, the the needs that you have in those situations are going to be different for everybody. Mm -hmm. And so real air measurement is a fantastic tool that we use, but it all still comes back to what do you need? What are you looking for? Yeah. I also do wonder, I I do wonder as well, so I know that it's mandated by Costco. Um, I know that they're supposed to be running it, and maybe they are running it, but are they utilizing that measurement the way that you need to in order to actually then make the proper adjustments? Because I have seen, just in the last month, I think four different people from Costco, and I hook them up and do real ear measurement, and a, every one of them told me that no, nothing like that was done. I take that with a grain of salt because if you're not explaining what you're doing and, and all that, like, you don't, I don't really know that. But they are atrociously malfitted, whether it's absurdly overfit in certain areas, but vast majority underfit. Underfit. Like, to a level that I am just nearly speechless about because no wonder you don't feel like they're doing anything. No wonder you actually feel like you hear better without them in because you're all wrong. Yeah. It's, it's all incorrect. So you're saying that they, they're doing it, they're just not doing it correctly or they're not actually matching the prescription or they match the prescription and they back them too far away from I it. I think or that happens potentially yeah. all the time. I think what happens is that they really do match them and get them close enough. And then what happens is some sort of report of, hmm, my voice sounds weird. And do you have the time to sit there and counsel on why your own voice might Mm -hmm. sound strange initially? I don't have five minutes to talk that out. So I'm going to make an adjustment. Click, click, click. I'm going to keep going. Oh, voice sound better. Voice sound better. Your voice sounds better. Okay, great. Yeah, and it's a little scratchy when I I put my hair right here. And again, that's another conversation for why that is. Um, But it's much easier for me in this moment to click, 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 take that down. Oh, that's gone. Okay, great. All right, excellent. So now you're super comfortable in how you're hearing and when you leave you're going to have the same exact issues that you walked in with Mm -hmm. because we've taken this prescription and we've gone "Eh, i'm going to make all these changes to the prescription Mm -hmm. now based on your reports rather than counseling through what's the trade-off when we do Mm -hmm. something like that oh we're severely underfitting you in the low pitches we're severely underfitting you in the high pitches here's what that's going to do for speech understanding Mm -hmm. here's what's what that's going to do for volume perception there's so many things, like time, time, yeah. time. Like, can you yeah. tell I'm just and you have you have personal experience with not I having was time. In, I was there. I mean, I wasn't Costco, but I was in a very similar setup to Costco. I was in an ENT office, but it's still the same. I could see upwards of 25 people in a day. <laughs> what? I no. think the most I've ever seen at Applied Hearing Solutions in a single day is maybe like 10 maybe 12 and that's really like a day of just clean and check visits you know a lot of them um i could see 25 people in a day and what choice did i have i mean like quit i mean (laughs) sure did you can go look someplace (laughs) else (laughs) put in my notice pretty quickly um and that was because i really felt like I, i i only had the option to either complete the uh, procedures that I thought would give the patient the best bang for their buck in that moment, but I had to sacrifice all of the counseling that went along mm-hmm. with it for them to understand why I was doing the things I was doing. Or I could counsel the pants off of them, but not actually be able to measure or verify anything I was doing at all. And so I just kind of had to talk through why mm-hmm. things were happening, but didn't have the time to to check it out and to investigate it further. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So my yeah. hands were tied and I would presume that a lot of Costco providers' hands are tied. I'm not gonna speak for everybody on this one, but I just would assume given the volume of patients yeah. that they see, that it has to be somewhat similar to that situation. Yeah. And I, I have in. to sympathize with Costco providers that are put in that mm-hmm. position. Oh, right? when I was in that position, yeah. I was sitting there going, I hate this. Um, and not everybody at Costco hates their job mm-hmm. by any stretch of, uh, of the imagination. But I just knew that I was not able to give every single patient my best every time. I had so many constraints on me that I just went, this is the best that I have for a 10 minute appointment. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'll see you two weeks from now and we'll do 10 minute spurts for the next nine months. Yeah, and I would like to get into some of the specifics and examples that we've seen, because I would, I don't know the number on this. I was thinking of it the other day of how many, since we opened up the clinic in 2017, how many 
patients that we've received from Costco. So they went to Costco, they got treated for whatever reason, lack of success, lack of convenience of going there, they ended up coming to us and having us adopt them either with their existing yeah. Costco hearing aids or with new technology mm -hmm. from us. Yeah. Um, and it happens a lot. You said that All like the in the last four month, like four, four this month, we probably have hundreds, if not approaching in the thousands of, of, uh, people who come over from Costco. Yeah, I believe so, that. So like what, you guys have both actually gone through two uh, memorable recent patients coming over from Costco. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Beck, we'll start with you. Yeah, this is probably one of the most egregious ones that I have um, gone through. And I have a lot of feelings personally as a professional about all of the ways in which this particular individual has been wronged by Costco. Um, I know for a fact, um, because three people went with him for his initial fitting, um, that really a measurement was not done. The little microphone tubes were not placed in his ear. I know from the software that he was on first fit with a few different modifications. That's crazy, because yeah. it's a requirement by, it by law, like legally. And, and to be fair, most of the people that I have seen come over from Costco are on first fit. So that's I where I really struggle with this idea of they maybe matched to the prescription and then made a whole bunch of adjustments that got them off their prescription because I just I haven't seen it and I don't but I don't want to like make that a blanket statement either because I'm sure that there are Costco providers who are well, doing I've it had, the right I've way. Just to, I don't want to interrupt your story, but I've had um, providers uh, reports to me from providers who love running real ear and, and do it with high levels of precision. They spoke to a single. All right, not everybody, N of one here, a single Costco provider is like, yeah, I run it, I hit run, I don't make any changes, I print off the slip, put it in the chart, realer measurement was done. Oh. So it's not outside the realm of possibility that you could do it. I do think that Costco probably has implemented more controls since then, but based on what you're telling me, I'm not 100% oh. sure on that. I hope so. Um he has a very severe loss, um, severe flat loss. He was in uh, non-custom rubber domes with power receivers, um, which means that all of the good amplification that he could be getting just leaking right out of his ears. The most egregious thing that he has reported to me about this Costco experience is that he asked about the custom ear molds. So a little bit even more of a backstory. He had initially come to us for a consultation. At the time, financially, we were not an option for him. So he went to Costco knowing the recommendation we made. One of those things were custom ear molds. Well, they initially fit him without custom ear molds. He was having a whole bunch of problems. And he went back and said, well, you know, the other audiologist that I saw really recommended custom ear molds. What do you guys think? And they said, well, that'll make your hearing worse. I actually hear that fairly regularly, and Wait. I have no idea why that's happening. I think it's time again. If you have to do impressions that take 15, 20, 30 minutes, and that's going to take your time away from other people who don't need custom ear molds, and I you're going to move along. I did an impression in three minutes today. Well, you get to laser people's Top ears. Top bottom. No, no, no. Physical ear impression. I got the material out, had it mixed, had it in his ear. I think total even cleanup time was like six minutes. But it really doesn't take all that much time if you just have your setup ready to go. It really doesn't. And that's why it really makes me upset. Yeah. Because this particular person needs custom ear molds. There's yeah. no way. And asked for them. And asked for them. Point and blank. was told, no, that's, that's going to make your hearing worse. And I cannot understand a, a, a certified, you know, licensed hearing care professional telling somebody with that severe of a loss that, hear, that anyway, that's just one component. So, you know, he came in for his consultation, ran real ear with the domes that he had on them, and it was abysmal. I mean, he wasn't even above his threshold for most of the frequency range, so he wasn't even able to detect the sounds that were coming out of his hearing aids. Like, no wonder he hates them. Um, but we also ran that speech and background noise test again. This particular individual has a severe hearing loss with a 17 dB SNR loss. A 17 dB SNR loss is meaning, means that if you go into background noise, or really anywhere, but if you're in noise especially, you need someone to talk 17 decibels louder than the background noise to barely understand what someone is saying. For frame of reference, every time you go up by 10 decibels, you're actually doubling the perceived volume, and he's almost at 20 decibels. So he needs somebody to talk like 40 decibels louder or four times louder than the background noise rather 
to be able to hear somebody. So if you're in a moderately noisy restaurant, you know, 70 decibels, he needs what, 87 decibels? Not a single person other than probably me and Dr. Cliff here <laughs> could probably consistently talk at 87 decibels. Yeah. And even then after probably 30 minutes, I'm probably done, right? Yeah. But so the amount of struggle he will still have when his hearing aids are actually programmed fully to his prescription in the most optimized way humanly possible, he still will have a lot of struggle in background noise. So did they recommend that he do assistive listening devices and things like that? Um, I don't know that they recommended it to him. I think he did a little bit more of his research on his own because he was having problems in background noise and he bought a few different Roger devices, so um, FM systems that he could um, utilize um, on his own and try to figure out how to do it by himself and he did I mean he has them paired up they mostly work I mean I tested them this week and they're functioning I even got them tethered together but the they sounded bad because the hearing aids still dictate how that sound how that is processed and if your hearing aids are not set up ideally I don't care what remote remote accessories that you have, you're going to put them onto somebody's mouth and you're still not gonna be able to detect the sound because he was so far below his prescription. Right. So he was trying to do all of the right things for himself. He was asking good questions. He was trying to advocate for himself and still was not able to be treated a appropriately. Um, and it really just hurts my heart. He And he's gone for, you know, the last year just hating. And he's like, I can't spend time with my family. He lives in an assisted living. He's like, I can't even go into the dining hall because I cannot, I can't talk to anybody. I can't, like, it's, it's more lonely being in a room full yeah. of people and can't socialize than it is just be at his house by himself. Well, I think you were telling me because you're spending hours with this individual, right? Getting yeah. him back on track. Mm -hmm. um, how have things been going? Much better. So I, um, he came in actually for a brief uh, appointment actually with Dr. Balderas, who also works at our clinic. Um, we had just fit him and less than a week later he had wax traps that were filled and I hadn't reviewed care and maintenance with him. So he came back in, she reviewed care and maintenance with him and got even a little bit more of the Roger stuff figured out. But I just saw him for his one week follow up, which is typically only an hour. But when he came in to talk to Dr. Balderas, I actually had them move the appointment so I could have a whole hour and a half with him. And even then, I still probably wanted a little bit more time. I should have given myself two hours. Um, and then after that appointment, I also scheduled him for an hour next week as well because we made a ton of adjustments. I was showing him how to use, you know, the Roger app and how to tether things together. And so we had a lot of information to cover and I wanted to give him the weekend to gather his soak questions, it soak it in. But if there are any still major issues, I don't want him to have to go, you know, three weeks until his next scheduled appointment yeah. without having... Um, consistent follow-up because he just needs it right now and we have that flexibility because we've you've structured the clinic in a way that gives us the time and flexibility to do that because some people need that some people need us to you know cut off half an hour of their follow-ups because they're just doing so well out of the gate this is not that person and there's no way no, no way that Costco could have supported him in the way he needed to be supported. You know, and the, the only con that comes, or the negative that comes along with allotting the time is it has to cost you more, yep. mm -hmm. right? Like we have to charge our patients more mm -hmm. than what Costco does yep. to provide them with hours and hours and hours, if necessary, of follow-up care to make sure that they're actually treated the right way. Mm -hmm. oh, so, yeah. um, so like we're not absolved of any like no. negatives. Uh, as a private practice, there's definitely things like you're going to spend more money for mm -hmm. hearing aids, more money for the services that you get. Um, but our goal is is not to be the cheapest option, mm -hmm. not to be the lowest cost option, rather. Uh, it's to be the best option yeah. that you can possibly go to. And, and with that, I mean, even outside of, you know, the time I actually spent with him, I mean, there was, a, there was another hour that I spent on the phone with Phonak, right, trying to get... Uh, you know, all the information that I could, you know, trying to delve a little bit into what those differences are between, you know, the Phonak Paradise and the KS10s that he's wearing so that I can reasonably counsel what are, you know, what are you giving up? You know, what what do you need? What And all of those things. And so even outside of actual patient interaction, I'm still doing work behind the scenes to make sure that he's, again, well cared for by the time he comes in next week for yeah. me to see him again. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, Dr. Cook, you actually had a recent experience with uh, one or more uh, I was gonna say, Costco I was gonna say, I feel like I feel like I got them all the time. Um, yeah, this individual um, had a loud noise exposure event a couple of years ago and um, realized shortly after this event that they were having 
significant difficulty hearing. It's very, very likely that this hearing loss had been developing for quite some time, but this loud noise exposure event was what was really brought to light that the hearing difficulties were significant enough to seek treatment. Um, so he goes, he gets his hearing aids from Costco, um, doesn't do well with them. And he's a musician and musicians in particular really need to have not only great devices, but those devices need to be programmed perfectly and with precision because there is an element of musical fidelity that comes with having your devices programmed precisely. Um, he comes to me, he says, oh, you know, I, I, you know, I don't think I'm doing that bad. Um, music doesn't sound great at all, but uh, other than that, you know, I'm getting by. And his wife is sitting in the corner going, no, he's not. <laughs> not no, getting he's by. not. We are, she goes, we are not getting by. He might be getting by. I am not getting by. So, um, you know, we do his evaluation and pretty standard. I mean, he's got a significant amount of hearing loss, but it's a pretty standard symmetrical sloping. And um, then I run real ear measurement on his Kirkland Signature 10.0 T's, which he loves the telecoil because he goes to a church that mm -hmm. has telecoil. Awesome. Thank goodness, that was pretty cool. Um, his devices were so significantly underfit that they really were serving as earplugs mm -hmm. in that moment. Now, and what do you mean by underfit here for those who might not understand the terminology? Sure. So um, there's a hearing loss prescription that is generated based off of your hearing evaluation results. And using real ear measurement, we are able to measure exactly what's coming out of the hearing aids in real time to see where it falls in accordance with your hearing loss prescription. Anywhere where the output is above and beyond your prescription, I would consider to be overfit and anywhere where the output of your hearing aids is below your hearing loss prescription you are now underfit so not uh, receiving enough amplification not getting, to not, meet your prescription to ensure that you can hear the sounds that you need to hear exactly so you've got to be able to hit your prescription to really get the full access to sounds that you're missing back and this individual was uh underfit to the tune of 20 to 30 decibels <laughs> don't even wear the hearing aids at that point i told him that yeah i literally said at this point, wear them, don't wear them, doesn't matter. They're not doing a thing for mm -hmm. you. Um, in fact, the closest place that they were coming um, to his prescription was like 6,000 hertz of all places. It was really strange. And he's so like, yeah, I just hear, I hear some really just weird scratching all the time. And I'm like, yeah, that's yeah. because you have this rogue <laughs> peak out at 6,000 hertz and then nothing else. Like, I don't know what happened in there. I don't know where this came from. All I know is that he was struggling really, really badly, and I think he was afraid to admit that he mm -hmm. was struggling as bad as he was because his wife was not afraid to admit that this is a huge problem. Right. Um, already, I have seen him for his fitting and for his follow-up, and his wife comes in and she's like, yeah, okay, we're hearing now. Mm -hmm. This is great. <laughs> um, you know, and of course, we still have many, many things to iron out in his process, but this is a, another perfect example of someone who was really trying to just get a good deal, and is the type of person that's also very particular with how mm -hmm. they like things to sound and for the last two years just hasn't really been able to mm -hmm. engage in the ways that he'd like to at all. Well, and I think you bring up a really good point when you're talking about his hearing test because, you know, I know that I talked about a pretty, you know, severe, very, even for us, you know, a very difficult case, right? But, you know, even this, this week, I refit KS10s that were fit at Costco and you know, didn't need custom ear molds, doesn't need a whole lot of background noise reduction because she does really well on background noise. Yeah. Like, doesn't, not, and none of these fancy things are necessary. And just by matching her to her full prescription, she came back, or she's going to come back. I know it because right in the office, she was like, yeah, you sound so much yeah. better. Uh -huh. Like, already just day one. And then her husband was soft-spoken, had, had him ask a question from the back of the room that, you know, she definitely knew the answer to. And she's, like, almost in tears because from a distance now with a quiet voice from behind her, no visual cues, nothing, she can hear him. Yeah. So sometimes it, e it isn't even just like these big complex cases, you know, yeah, your musician is picky. walk in the park patients yeah. that I look at it and I'm like, surely Costco knocked this out of the park, surely, right? right? And then I open it up and I'm like, I was wrong about that. Yeah. It's not looking pretty. Well, I mean, I say all the time, audiology is not rocket science. I, I mean, mm -hmm. I've never had anyone accuse me of being like the most intelligent person <laughs> anywhere ever. Except your uh, mom, maybe. Right, ex <laughs> except my mom. My mother for sure will do that. Um, 
But like, but there are fundamentals that you have to follow, and like you were talking about, you have to follow them with precision. And if you follow the rules of audiology, and you make sure that the patient understands yeah. why you have to follow these, so they're not telling you like, oh, just turn the volume down so it feels comfortable, right? Mm -hmm. And you do your job with precision, you're going to get a high level outcome. Mm -hmm. And and the goal is always to get someone to hear their best. Mm -hmm. So the way that someone would hear with their hearing aids is gonna be different than the way that someone else hears with their hearing aids, but the goal always stays the same, get them hearing their absolute best, yep. right? Um, and that really should be the goal of Costco with their patients, and I think that there are audiologists and hearing instrument specialists, because everybody who works there is licensed to work there um, based on the state requirements that each state has. And there's, there's good ones who can actually get you a good treatment outcome, but then there's obviously plenty who are not doing it. Oh, yeah. uh, and, and it might be because they don't have good enough training, it might be because they don't have enough time, it could be a, a variety of different variables. Mm -hmm. But I think the question needs to change from, is Costco a good place for me to go to get hearing aids to, is the provider at the Costco that I go to going to be able to uh, spend the amount of time that they need to with me and are they going to follow best practice procedures mm -hmm. in order to do it? Yeah, one tiny little side note on that too is that one negative for me is that it's very rare that you actually see the same hearing care professional when you go to Costco. So I obviously when we see our patients we do a little bit of back and forth if it's really needed or if the schedule's tight or something like that. But for the most part, when you start care with one of the providers at our clinic, you really have this long-term relationship where the provider gets to learn about how you hear and what your preferences really are mm -hmm. and the types of situations that you're in. But there is one major downside there, which is that these hearing aid centers that are open seven days a week on these vast hours, um, you're not always gonna see the same hearing care professional. So mm -hmm. the one person that knew everything about your case that you saw two weeks ago, mm -hmm. well, you walk up and someone has to learn everything about your case from mm -hmm. start to finish again. And then you go three, week, three weeks later and it's someone new again. Um, yeah. And, and, and you know, they don't know what the previous person tried necessarily. I no. mean, even amongst, you know, private practice audiologists, I mean, we've even done a whole, you know, reset on how we actually take notes mm -hmm. in our clinic because the way we were doing it before, we were getting some things lost in translation for those emergent cases where we did need to see somebody else's patient. So we, you know, saw that, fixed that little gap that we had so that we could, you know, better service people when they needed to see a different provider. Right. And I don't know that Costco necessarily has something like that in place because, you know, you go and see one person, they try three different things and none of them work. So they said, well, this might just be how it is. And then you try something else, try and go to somebody else. And then they try the same different th three different things yeah. rather than, you know, maybe they did have another idea, but everybody started with those same three things right. because that's where I would start too. But I know that the last time when I tried that, that didn't, that didn't work. work. So next time, I can have other ideas or, you know, I've done some other research and said, okay, well, what have other people tried as well? Yeah. So you lose a little bit of that uh, when you have to see multiple people and not necessarily have a great noting system in place. Yeah, I think moral of the story that. for all of this is just, you have to be educated as an individual with mm -hmm. hearing loss. Mm -hmm. I mean, as, as much as I would even love people to just trust what I'm going to do in the clinic, yeah. I really still think that you should be educated yourself so even when I'm trying to educate you along a treatment process or mm -hmm. we're trying to educate someone along a treatment process, it should not be the first time that they're really like hearing that. They should right. have done research uh, prior to that, ideally. Um, and you know, if nothing else, to make sure that they don't you know, suffer with hearing loss continually mm -hmm. because things are not actually being done the right way. Because as you now know, everything is extremely individualized when mm -hmm. it comes to hearing health care. Yeah. Awesome. Well, great discussion yeah. today. That was yeah. fantastic. I think that would hopefully provide you guys with a lot of value. If you like today's episode, make sure that you hit that thumbs up button. We really appreciate it. And if you're not subscribed to the channel, go ahead and hit that subscribe button with notification bell. And as always, we will see you next time.